Hello and welcome to another episode of the Finrestra podcast. I am Jan Muschold. In this episode, I won't be starting the episode with news. In fact, I'll do a look back at some long-term trends that have been accelerated or broken at the episode of the end of the summer. Um, But because it's the summer, a lot of people are on holidays where you will be enjoying nice food, um, sunny weather, Maybe you will visit some museum or old buildings and while you're at your holiday destination you will probably also notice that hmm, the banks that you see there are quite different from the ones at home. And that's why in this episode I want to talk some more about the banks in, in the most popular European tourist destinations. So let's start at number 7, Greece. So we can be very brief about banking in Greece because there are only four major banks which are all uh, Greek owned and so the banking system is very concentrated there. So when you're in Athens or maybe in Crete and you're watching um, the beautiful um, ancient uh, buildings or you're just enjoying the beach and and you have some um, feta and, and some other delicacies you'll probably notice that the the main banks in Greece are Alpha Bank, Eurobank, National Bank of Greece and Piraeus Bank so you will hardly find any uh, foreign banks maybe one or two in Athens Um, but that's all I can say about uh, Greece. Then uh, the sixth most popular tourist destination in Europe is Austria and in Austria you have three major banks which are Erste Bank, the Raiffeisen Group and also Italian Unicredit is active in uh, in Austria. Now I said when you're on holiday you will probably notice um, unfamiliar banks but that's not quite true in Austria at least if you're living in Central or Eastern Europe because while Austria is a, is a small country with less than 10 million inhabitants the Austrian banks, so Erste Bank and Raiffeisen Bank International, they have tens of millions of clients in uh, Central and Eastern Europe. Then we'll move on to the northern neighbor of Austria, which is Germany, um, the largest economy in Europe. And of course, everybody working in fi- uh, finance will know about Deutsche Bank. Um, but for a lot of German retail clients, they are not um, they don't bank with uh, with Deutsche Bank but um, some of the most popular banking groups or or banking brands in Germany are the local uh, Volksbanken and Sparkassen so if you are on holiday in Germany you will notice like the V sign or the the S sign of the Volksbanken and the, the Sparkassen now, um, Germany also has a major financial center in, uh, in Frankfurt, but the chances are small that you will be in Frankfurt to, to pass your holidays because uh, Frankfurt is really a financial city. It's not that big of a city in Germany. I think it's only like the, the sixth or the seventh largest city. So there are m- many larger cities like, for example, Berlin or Hamburg or Munich so the the reason why Frankfurt became Germany's financial center um, actually dates back to the second world war so if we go back to the 19th century and the birth of uh, of modern Germany in the yeah about the year 1870 um, then because Berlin was the capital of Prussia and yeah the the new um, Germany Berlin really was the financial capital of the city. So, for example, Deutsche Bank was founded um, in the city and also other big banks were uh, were there. But then, of course, after the Second World War, you probably know that um, Eastern Germany was occupied by the Soviet Union and um, Berlin was fully surrounded by um, the German Democratic Republic. So it didn't make a lot of sense for for the capitalist banks in Western Germany to keep their headquarters in uh, in Berlin. And that's why you saw in the, in the late 1940s that um, 
banks in West Germany were based um, in, in different cities like in Dusseldorf or in Frankfurt or in Munich or, or other cities. Um, so the question is, why did Frankfurt eventually win out or, or like why did it come out on top? And um, I've read some details about it in, in some scientific papers. And basically the story goes that um, Frankfurt was in the American occupation zone and there was a very large airport there. And Frankfurt still has one of the largest um, airports in Europe to this day. Um, so it had good connections to, uh, to other cities and to other countries. And on top of that, the Bundesbank, so the German um, central bank, um, also um, moved to uh, Frankfurt after the war. So those are like two catalysts why Frankfurt became the major financial center of Germany. Um, what else should I tell you about Frankfurt? So after Brexit, it seems that um, Frankfurt managed to attract a lot of investment banks from um, the UK, which could no longer serve um, the European Union from London. So they had to set up a headquarters or, or a local subsidiary in the European Union. And it seems that a lot of these um, investment banks, like for example, JP Morgan or Goldman Sachs or Swiss UBS, um, they set up shop in, uh, in Frankfurt. Then we move on to um, yeah across the, the English Channel, so outside of the European Union to the United Kingdom, where obviously the city of London is the largest financial center in Europe and even one of the largest international financial centers of the world. So what will you find in the city of London? Of course, you will find the, the large British banks like HSBC or Barclays, but there are also a lot of um, major American banks like JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Bank of America. Um, and from my own research that I did a couple of years ago, I know that in fact almost all of the, the largest banks in the world also have some representation in London, what you don't see, for example, in, in Paris or in Frankfurt. So in London, you will find banks from China, from Japan, South Korea, from Australia, Latin America, uh, Canada. Yeah, really all of the, the major banks that you can think of have some kind of representation in London. And that's because London yeah, is, is where everything is happening. And it's also the major or the largest uh, foreign exchange trading center in the world where almost 50% of all FX trading globally happens in, uh, in the United Kingdom. And maybe for those of you have, who have seen the, the series Industry about the um, investment bank or the fic fictional investment bank Beerpoint, um, we'll also notice that that, um, that series was um, based in London. Some other statistic that I remembered from my research is that the British trade surplus in financial services is even larger than the German trade surplus in cars. So the, the financial se uh, sector in the UK um, is really one of the largest in the world and, and makes a huge um, contribution to, to GDP and to export. Um, now, for those of you who visit Great Britain and go outside of London, then you will notice that, um, yeah, of course, you will also find um, HSBC and Barclays, but um, for, for most British people, uh, for retail banking, you will also see that people go to, to Lloyd's, for example, or NatWest, the, the former Royal Bank of Scotland. Um, you also have Santander, who has a big subsidiary for retail clients. Or, for example, the, the British uh, Nationwide Building Society is also quite a large player in the rest of, uh, of the UK. Then we'll move on back to, um, to the continent in southern Europe, where Italy is the third largest tourist destination in Europe. And probably if you visit Italy, you will go to, for example, to Rome um, to watch the, the circus or, or Vatican City or some other 
um, old buildings or maybe you go to Naples or you go somewhere um, along the coast. But the, the largest banks of Italy are based in the north and the, industri and the most industrialized part of the country. So the biggest Italian banks are um, Intesa San Paolo, which is mainly focused yeah, as the largest domestic bank and also the, the largest Italian bank by, uh, by total assets. Um, probably somewhat better known for foreign people is uh, Unicredit because that's also a global systemically important bank. While editing this episode, I noticed that I forgot to mention something. So Italian banking, apart from the two large banks, is quite fragmented and there are still quite some uh, regional banks. And one that I should definitely mention for tourists is Monte Pasci di Siena, based uh, like the, the name implies in uh, the Tuscan city of Siena. And that's the oldest still operational bank in the world, uh, founded in the year 1472. So if you're in Italy this summer and you're in Tuscany, you should, je you should uh, check out the building of um, MPS. Now, um, the financial center of Italy is not in Rome, but also in the north in, uh, in Milan. In contrast to Frankfurt and Germany, Milan is, um, I guess, the second largest city of, uh, of Italy. And it's not just a financial city, um, but you also have other industries like, uh, like fashion, for example. I remember from my research that um, there, there is a definite correlation between airports and financial centers in Europe. So Milan also has, has I think, two large airports and is one of the busiest airports in Italy and, and also in the, the top of uh, European airports. Then we stay in Southern Europe, but more to the West than because Spain is the second most popular holiday destination for uh, tourists in uh, Europe. And in Spain, you basically have three big banks. So the biggest one is um, Banco Santander, and the second largest one is um, BBVA. And those may seem familiar to you, and especially for people from, from the Americas, and especially Latin America, because both Santander and BBVA have um, large operations in Mexico, and for example, Santander also in Brazil. And their Spanish home market is uh, smaller in terms of revenue than um, those American subsidiaries generate in, in revenue. Now, the largest domestic bank in Spain is not Santander or BBVA, but is a Caixa Bank. So um, what you need to know about Caixa Bank or, or what is remarkable about it is that it's one of the, the few major European banks whose um, stock price have, has risen this year. So, of course, after the um, Russian invasion of Ukraine, a lot of um, bank stocks have gone down. Um, 20 30 percent but Caixa Bank managed to go up now the Spanish government isn't making it fear very easy for uh, Spanish banks because they have announced that there will be a special bank tax so we'll see um, if um, if stock prices remain high now something other remarkable about the Spanish banks is that um, all three so Santander BBVA and uh, Caixa Bank they all originated or have their roots in the industrialized uh, northeastern part of uh, Spain. So Santander, um, yeah, the name uh, already says it, comes from uh, Santander at the Atl Atlantic coast in the north. Um, BBVA comes from Bilbao, also um, at the no uh, northern coast. And then Caixa Bank originally um, came from Barcelona, um, but has moved due to the independence movement. Um, it has moved its headquarters to uh, Valencia, more to the south at the Mediterranean coast. And then finally, um, we arrive at uh, France, which is the top one tourist destination in Europe. And I guess if you're working in finance, you will yeah, almost certainly know BNP Paribas and uh, Société Générale or SOCGEN. Um, however, if you're in a French village, so outside of Paris, 
um, you will probably notice that um, yeah, in a French village you always have the, the mairie, the, the city hall and you, you will have some nice cafes and, and the boulanger, the, the bakery shop um, but um, for um, retail banking you'll notice that French people um, have access to banks like uh, Crédit Agricole or um, Caisse d'Epargne or Crédit Mutuel um, so these are some of the, the largest um, French banks domestically. And what's remarkable is um, I'm working on a video about the largest banks in Europe. And I remember that of the 20 largest commercial banks in Europe, six of them are French. So compared to only one German bank, Deutsche Bank, in the top 20, um, and that's that has a quite um, interesting reason, which I'll save for another podcast. Um, now, something else that I should mention is that, um, like in Italy and Spain, um, the French banking system is very French. So there are um, almost no uh, foreign banks operating. Um, HSBC used to have a division in France, but they they sold it. And then something else that I should mention about France is that unlike Frankfurt, it doesn't seem that uh, Paris gained a lot from Brexit in terms of uh, banks that moved there. The only major institution that came from London to Paris is uh, the EBA or the European Banking Authority, which is a, a regulator for, uh, for European banks. So this has been a summer episode of the Fenerestra podcast. Um, in August, I'll do something with, yeah, you could say fan fiction or, or like um, a story about how BNP Paribas could become the largest bank in the world. And then I should say that if you follow this podcast on the Finrestra YouTube channel, you will also find a lot of uh, bank profiles of, uh, of banks that I mentioned today. So, for example, you can find Santander in two minutes, but also BNP Paribas, um, I did a profile of Deutsche Bank and in the future I will also do um, bank profiles of banks like BBVA or, or UBS which I didn't uh, talk about today because that's based in Switzerland. Now if you like this episode of course you can uh, subscribe um, because this helps um, find other people um, find the podcast if you also leave a, a rating and a review. And then I, yeah, I wish you a very happy summer. And then, as I already mentioned in the beginning, at the end of August, I'll do a, a large recap of the news and also do some trends. And then later in the year or, or in the fall, um, I'll do some podcasts about um, the European Central Bank again and other topics that, that might interest you if you're working in finance. So I was Jan Muschot, thanks for listening and till next time.